Welcome to Bright Divinity School Borderlands Institute Fall Webinar Series on the theme of Responsibility and Immigration. My name is Francisco Losada Jr. and I'm the director of the Borderlands Institute at Bright. We are very excited about this series and especially grateful to the Henry Luce Foundation for Theology for making this event possible. I would like to add that all webinar events are recorded and you can find them on Bright's YouTube page in a few days after the event. Briefly, for those who are new, this webinar series aims to bring awareness to the very complex issues around immigration and inspires to make a modest contribution to lift up the voices of vulnerable migrants and providing new counter narratives to these issues. We have discussed so far uh, this, this fall, uh, xenophobia and migration, children and migration, and today we, we, we want to discuss genders and sexualities and migration, a topic often glossed over in discussions on migration. Our distinguished presenter today is Professor Ethna Luvade, who is Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Arizona and the former director of UA's Institute for LGBT Studies. Her research focuses on the connections among queer lives racialization processes, state immigration controls, and justice struggles. Professor Louvade is also author of Pregnant on Arrival, Making the Illegal Immigrant, published by the University of Minnesota's Press in 2013. She is also the author of Entry Denied, Controlling Sexuality at the Border, and also published through the University of Minnesota Press in 2002. And most recently, Professor Louvade, along with Carmen Chavez, published Dynamics of Illegalization, Detention, and Deportation in 2020 through the University of Illinois Press, and from which many of you have already read her essay in it entitled, Treated Neither with Respect Nor with Dignity, Contextualizing Queer and Transmigrant Illegalization, Detention, and Deportation. I first came to know Professor Louvade through her scholarship and through another co-edited volume with Lionel, Lionel Cantu entitled Queer Migrations, Sexuality, U.S. Citizenship, and Border Crossings, published by Minnesota Press in 2005. Her work is indispensable in understanding the multifaceted interconnection between queer sexualities, migrations, and citizenship. Her work is also very popular among our Bright students who frequently use it in their presentations and projects. They even draw from it for their sermons. So you see, we are quite excited and honored to have Professor Louvade with us today. Today's presentation is entitled Genders, Sexuality, Sexualities and Migrations, Current Debates and Possible Futures. As the presentation begins, feel free to begin submitting questions in the chat room we will try our best to address them at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, join me with a virtual clap and welcoming Professor Louvade. Uh, the stage is now yours, Ethna. Thank you. Thank you so much. So good morning, everybody, and welcome. And I want to warmly thank Dr. Francisco Losada as well as Clayton, Rowena, and all the other people who have been organizing this series, the Luce Foundation, and all of you for making time to be here. In our time today, I'm going to spend about 40 minutes setting up a framework for thinking about how genders, sexualities, and migrations interact, and then we'll open for discussion and questions. And you'll see, how do I do on technology in this platform? So I'm gonna use a, a PowerPoint to walk us through. Somehow bringing up the PowerPoint um, just caused a, an imbalance in the system. So apologies, everybody. But let's see if we can now actually work through this PowerPoint. Oops. 
Okay, Clayton, can you can you be the one to move us through the slides? And if so, could you move us to the next slide, please? There we go. Okay, thank you, Clayton. You're my assistant on this one. So folks, here's a preview of what I hope to cover in the 40 minutes that I have. First of all, just uh, some comments about understanding why is it that people are migrating. Second of all, there is a vast scholarship that shows that gender and sexuality shape and are reshaped by migration. So I want to speak about that, but for us to do that, let's begin by establishing a shared vocabulary. What is gender? What is sexuality? And also becoming aware of some colonialist narratives of migrant genders and sexualities that it's helpful to avoid. I want to speak briefly about what I'm calling gender, sexuality, migration, and arrival in at or in the United States. And then finally bringing it together by talking about creating the futures that we want, some principles, practices, and starting places. Since my time is very brief, um, we, uh, there will be probably lots of questions you want me to address, and we will get into those in the question and answer at the end. These points were also discussed in my chapter that was shared in advance of today's session and that some of you have read. The chapter comes from a book I co-edited with my friend, Dr. Karma Chavez. The book is called Queer and Trans Migrations, Dynamics of Illegalization, Detention, and Deportation. And it critically explores how migrants crossing national borders are being made undocumented, detainable, and deportable by global northern states. The book centers queer and trans migrants' experience of these issues in particular, and it helps us to understand current configurations of power and violence, while also documenting extraordinary histories of refusal, resistance, and dreaming and working to create another world. While I was preparing my presentation for today, I came across a statement called Beloved Home. Beloved Home is one of the pillars of the transgender agenda for liberation that was posted on the Transgender Law website. And the beloved home pillar beautifully addresses many of the points that I hope to cover today. So I'm gonna organize my talk around that pillar. The beloved home primarily centers gender. So I'm also gonna incorporate sexuality as I speak. And we'll start with the question of why people migrate and thank you already for putting that slide up. So here's what beloved home says about why people are migrating. It says forced migration is violent, the colonization and genocide of indigenous people and the enslavement of black indigenous people of Africa to enrich the coffers of Western Europe and the United States are examples of forced migration and a pattern of violent Western imperialism that has robbed us of our land and culture around the world. To discuss migration, it is helpful to begin by acknowledging that migration and migrants are extremely diverse, ranging from folks who are on the run from violence and terror to folks with a million dollars to invest in a business that gets them fast-tracked for legal status and all kinds of diverse people in between. So on one hand, we it's important to not homogenize immigrants but we can certainly locate migration processes in the framework that the beloved home statement lays out. A substantial body of scholarship affirms the arguments made by beloved home that migration occurs because of histories, legacies, and ongoing dynamics of colonialism, settler colonialism, capitalism, and unfree racialized labor and their gender and sexual regimes. To make meaningful changes in immigration dynamics, policymakers would need to address those issues. That's not, however, how US policymakers or mainstream media 
generally talk about why migration is occurring. Mainly they talk about migration as a matter of people making personal choices. And certainly this is partly true. Migrants are making decisions and choices. What, get le what gets left out, however, is migrants are making decisions and choices in a context of histories and dynamics of inequality. And the US has played and still plays a large role in these histories and dynamics that are causing migration. From within a framework of choice that largely disregards context and history, mainstream media and policymakers generally suggest the best way to manage migration is not by addressing root causes or redressing historical inequalities, but instead by further militarizing the border and further expanding logics and practices of criminalization. And we've already seen what three decades at least of that looks like. Since these strategies do not address what is driving migration, the approach is obviously not going to do much to achieve the government's stated goals. But it does put many migrants in difficult, precarious, and often life-threatening situations. The focus on militarization and criminalization draws on and reinforces systems of criminalization and incarceration that disproportionately affect US citizens and legal residents who are indigenous, black, people of color, poor, gender nonconforming, and queer. To put this differently, US immigration policies are deeply intertwined with the structural inequalities shaping the lives of those living in the US. And it's helpful to keep that connection in mind because public discussions often suggest that doing something helpful for migrants is harmful for citizens. Whereas in fact, migrants and citizens share many interests in common and working together can strengthen both. U.S. immigration laws and policies work in tandem with militarization and criminalization to open paths to legal status for some migrants and not for others. Historically, U.S. immigration laws have been explicitly racist, colonialist, settler colonialist, capitalist, and patriarchal. They favored admission and settlement by white, middle-class, cisgender, heteropatriarchal nuclear families from Northern and Western Europe, while routing everyone else into either temporary, exploitable, or unauthorized status. Since 1965, some of the explicitly racist, sexist, and heterosexist language of immigration law has been cleaned up. But the logic still prevail. Pathways to legal admission today are still basically organized around supporting migration by middle class gender normative individuals and couples, or those with substantial financial or cultural capital, or those who fit a very narrow definition of needing protection. For everyone else, there is no path to long term legal admission, no matter how worthy folks are or how urgent their situation. And thus, although people often ask, why don't immigrants just get in line to get status? For millions, there is no line. Overall, the US migration control system emerged from and remains an engine for what Harsha Walia describes as, quote, anti-indigenous, anti-black and imperialist warfare in which gender and sexual logics are central. That system continually reproduces but normalizes inequalities within the nation and between the US and other countries in a system that some describe as global apartheid. So this is a little bit on the big picture of why migration is happening and how we can situate US immigration controls in larger context. So Clayton, may I have the next slide, please? Thank you so much. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the imagery. A lot of these slides use images of the work by Fabiana Rodriguez and also work by Julio Salgado, 
who are at the center for cultural power and whose artworks and imagery has really been the language and heartbeat of extraordinary social movements. Now let's go, this is the next portion of the Beloved Home Statement from the Transgender Law website. And this portion expresses that gender shapes migration, including forcing people to flee. And we could same, say the same for sexuality. The statement says transgender, gender non-conforming, non-binary people who flee from Africa, Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and the Caribbean are escaping hunger, poverty, crime, and war, coupled with transphobia, homophobia, religious persecution, and misogyny. So I'm gonna work my way through that part of the statement, but I want to first take a few minutes to speak about what we mean by gender and sexuality so that we have a shared framework and vocabulary for talking together. Gender is a system for organizing social, economic, and political interactions, roles, obligations, and expectations in a stratified manner. How that happens changes by time and place, but the consistent part is that gender is about stratification. In the US, as we know, gender has been understood as binary, male or female. Everyone has been expected to fit one category or the other, and the categories are supposed to be clear cut, unambiguous and unchanging. Physical and other features of our body are supposed to confirm we fit one category or another. Work by trans identified and gender non-conforming folks have made some inroads into challenging these ways of thinking. But gender is still largely understood and addressed in binary ways, including in the immigration system. It's helpful to keep in mind that gender applies not just to women, or gender non-conforming folks, but to everybody. We're all part of a gender system. And that gender norms are inseparable from racial, economic, and sexuality norms, which I will get back to in a moment. And finally, the experience of migration, of crossing borders, and what happens to people in the US both builds on and also changes the meaning of gender and sexuality. Okay, so briefly, sexuality is also socially constructed, also a system of stratification. We tend to think people are defined by what we call sexual preference or orientation, that people are gay, straight, or somewhere in between, and that in between is getting very interesting these days. This has not always been the way sexuality was understood in the United States. And it's not how other societies understand it or stratify. Regardless of changes in how we understand sexuality, what remains constant is there is a dominant norm that values and privileges middle class, male, female couples from the dominant racial, ethnic and class group who have children within bonds recognized by law. Those who fit that norm are socially valued. They receive access to resources, rights, and protections. Those who do not fit are stigmatized, discriminated against, denied resources, and sometimes criminalized, imprisoned, or killed. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and gender non-conforming people are often not seen as fitting that norm and often experience various forms of stigma, discrimination, scapegoating, and violence. In the US, poor women of color with kids, migrant women with kids, sex workers, single migrant men of color, and others are also not seen as fitting that dominant norm and are commonly scapegoated, stigmatized, and targets of discrimination. And again, immigration laws and policies reflect and institutionalize these norms, which people also contest. So with this in mind, let's go back to the beloved home statement. 
That statement says that gender persecution and sexuality persecution and discrimination as well may push people to migrate. There are many reports and testimonies of the kinds of gender and sexual violence and terror that cause people to flee, often on very short notice, often with the clothes on their back and whatever they can hold. Gender and sexuality also shape the migration of folks who aren't fleeing or on the run, including by shaping decisions about whether to migrate and shaping access to resources that are needed to migrate, whether in terms of being able to cobble together funds or having social networks that give you important information or offer you somewhere to stay along the way or connect you with employment. So as that statement emphasizes, decisions about migration and the experience of migration are both gendered and gendering. And we could say the same for sexuality. That statement does something else very important, which is it describes gender and sexuality as experienced and shaping migration in a context of hunger, poverty, crime, and war. We could say that the authors treat gender and sexuality as intersectional rather than as standalone universal categories that are experienced the same way everywhere. And they highlight experiences of gender and sexuality are deeply shaped by things like struggles for food or having powerful outsiders invade your country and engage in war or histories that leave countries poor. And this is very different from how the US media and general public tend to talk about gender, sexuality, and migrants. In mainstream media, gender and sexuality are often talked about as universal, essential, the same everywhere, and unconnected to things like war, poverty, climate change, and militarized borders. Migrants are generally talked about as coming from, quote, less advanced cultures with, quote, less modern gender and sexual norms, and are imagined as fleeing to seek freedom in the United States, which is presumed to have the most modern and enlightened gender and sexual system in the world. The scholar Gayatri Spivak describes this as a colonialist racist story about benevolent white people saving brown women and brown queer and trans people from patriarchal brown men and so-called backward culture. And that colonialist mainstream story ignores that while gender and sexual harms definitely contribute to migration, those harms cannot be separated from the effects of global capitalism, colonialism, and climate change in which the US is deeply implicated. That common mainstream story also conveniently ignores that sexism, heterosexism, homophobia, and transphobia are deeply entrenched in the United States. And migrants who arrive in the United States have to deal with all those dynamics in ways that intersect with racism, settler colonialism, precarious xenophobia, in some cases, precarious legal status and economic struggles too. Overall, the beloved home statement offers important information and an important caution, which is that if we want to address gender and sexual persecution, discrimination and harms that cause some people to flee, and if we want to think how gender and sexuality shape and are reshaped by migration in, generally, in general, we need to do that in ways that don't participate in colonialist stories of the United States as an enlightened savior. Since these stories racialize and stereotype others, ignore the US's role in harms that cause migration, tend to frame migrants as either total victims or criminals, and ignores the extent to which sexism, heterosexism, transphobia, and homophobia are very serious issues here. Clayton, may I have the next slide, please? 
So beloved home tells us, yet if we leave our communities to seek a new home and find belonging, we are caged, criminalized, abused, and sadly in many cases killed. Through the use of a criminalization framework that includes mass incarceration and solitary confinement, the legal system is weaponized and used to systematically deny us any venues of relief. Black migrants are disproportionately subject to violence, terrorized by the double-edged sword of the immigration and criminal legal system. These systems that harm us continue to benefit for our imprisonment and avoid accountability. So to me, these sentences tell us that when people migrate, they often experience abuse, harm, exploitation, and in some cases, death during their journeys. Despite lofty rhetoric about the US as a safe haven, when people reach or cross US borders, they often face more violence and harm and are frequently denied possibilities for safety, basic subsistence, and dignity. The statement highlights these harms are commonly justified by the fact that migrants and migration are understood and responded to from with the framework, within a framework of crime, which I already mentioned and that is in the piece some of you read for today. Of course, we know migration is not a matter of crime, Nonetheless, a criminalization lens has been used to justify militarizing the border, scapegoating migrants, and building what is the world's largest migrant detention system. Migrant women, LGBTQ asylum seekers, ill people, exhausted and worn down migrants from all backgrounds are routinely detained by the US government under conditions of neglect, abuse, violence, and terror without the possibility of anyone being made accountable and often for indeterminate lengths of time. We know those experiences are gendered and they often involve sexual violence, systemic discrimination against gay and lesbian people and multiple harms against detained trans folks that reaches life-threatening levels. These experiences intersect with the racism, anti-Indigenous, anti-Black, anti-poor workings of the detention system. The beloved home statement names that the legal system, as well as criminalization processes, often contribute to harm by denying people avenues for getting out of detention, for getting legal status, or for getting accountability and instead blaming migrants for the harms that are inflicted on them. At the same time, it's critical to acknowledge the extraordinary work done by people who have mobilized the legal system to really make urgent changes. Even when they are not detained, migrants of all statuses frequently face difficulties getting work, lack of access to healthcare, housing, food, and safety, and adapting to racism, sexism, heterosexism, transphobia, and economic exploitation, often in tandem with language difficulties, uncertain status, and cultural difference. So reaching the US often means facing many more serious struggles. And finally, that part of the statement importantly reminds us that many people literally benefit and profit from the harms that migrants experience. One more slide, please, Clayton. The beloved home statement also offers helpful information as we think about moving forward. The statement says, those of us that survived these state-sanctioned horrors are left with few resources to recover from the trauma of leaving our homes and being incarcerated. Transgender, gender non-conforming and non-binary migrants, especially those from black communities, are rendered invisible in the mainstream US immigration narrative, as well as organizing and movement building strategies. This translates to policy and litigation goals that cannot 
and do not reflect the experience of those most impacted. Those goals and strategies are often U.S. centric, not taking into account how U.S. imperialism fuels forced migration and displacement. These policy and litigation goals often focus solely on legalization. And the narrative is driven by the economic benefits of immigration, making our lives only as worthy as our ability to engage in labor. I'm going to incorporate material from this slide into the next slides where I begin to talk about some principles and practices for moving forward. And obviously, I don't have a prescription for what should be done. That is more something that is a matter of conversation and discussion among us. But based on the talk I have shared, I am going to put up some general ideas for starting places, practices, and principles that may be helpful. The purpose of doing so is to, to really create an opportunity for us to think about how we can keep working together to create a different kind of future that we want. So inspired by Julio Salgado's very, very beautiful image of the butterfly and different configurations of migrant families, a helpful starting place for understanding what's happening and possibilities for what we can do is, first of all, to keep in mind that the U.S. immigration system stems from and contributes to upholding global histories and systems of inequality. That means U.S. policies could and perhaps should be rooted in questions of historical responsibility and accountability rather than national interest narrowly defined. Second, it's helpful to understand how the immigration system draws on, reinforces, and normalizes logics and practices that harm racialized, poor, queer, trans US citizens, legal residents, and everybody living in the United States, whatever their status. In this way, we can begin to challenge zero sum arguments that suggest helping migrants harm citizens when in fact our lives are intertwined and we are stronger working together. It's also helpful to challenge public discussions and policy frameworks that conceive migration just as a matter of individual choice. And migrants as making choices that politicians often describe as bad choices or wrong choices without paying attention to or addressing larger historical and structural contexts that are generating migration and that generate struggle and difficulty for marginalized people in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. We can recognize and challenge colonialist stories, whether about migrants as other and threatening or as victims who need to be, quote, saved, and policies based on that kind of thinking and the gendered and sexualized versions of these stories. It's urgent to challenge the way migration is being talked about and addressed as a problem of crime, rather than as a problem of people being harmed and displaced by US and other global powers ways of acting in the world, which is perpetuating displacement and dispossession. Decolonial feminist, queer and racial and economic justice frameworks give us grounds for making challenges accordingly. While challenging the criminalization of migration, we can link that to challenging criminalization and mass incarceration of marginalized people in the United States. Intersectionality. For any migration policy or proposal, it's always useful to ask what gender relations are imagined embedded in it or likely to be produced by it, even if gender is not explicitly stated. What sexual, economic, racial, and settler colonial relations are imagined, embedded, or likely to be produced? And I want to credit Lisa Hall with this as a strategy to think through policy proposals. 
For example, paths to legalization, which are really urgent, are often presented as neutral. But when you read the requirements, you see that they actually have gendered racial implications and they contribute to keeping many migrants in positions of economic exploitation. We can ask, does the proposed policy normalize inequalities among everyone living in the US? And rather than setting harmed groups in competition with one another, what's an approach to addressing migration that could benefit everybody? Thank you. Let's think about key social policies affecting life in the United States. What are the gender, sexual, racial, class, and settler colo colonial relations here? Are migrants included? And if not, why not? For example, are migrants able to access testing and care for COVID? And if not, or if some are not, how does this connect with histories of black, brown, indigenous, poor, and queer folks having difficulty accessing or having no access to health care? And how do we address all this together? The beloved home statement asked us to prioritize learning from, being guided by, and uplifting the experiences and perspectives and priorities of those who are most harmed by the current system. That statement also asked us to go beyond questions of legalization that are often based on thinking of migrants as bodies that can labor or go to war, to instead holistic consideration of the whole person and the whole life as valuable and beautiful. If we create migration policies that do this, beginning from the priorities of those most harmed by the current system, we're creating a world that fosters well-being and thriving for US citizens and legal residents too. Whether we're interested in reforming the system or abolishing it entirely, there's a lot to be done and anything we can do to transform is worth doing. And I want to show you just one final slide and then we'll open up. So this image um, was, was made in when Donald Trump called for proposals to build a fence along the entire length of the US-Mexico border. Uh, lots of artists and art collectives got to work and produced their own versions. I wanna share with you this one, which comes from a Malaysian design studio and their image of a border wall is of a 1,900 mile dinner table. So I thought that would perhaps be a very nice place on which to end. Um, to take down the PowerPoint and then to to um, have some discussion, comments, questions, and thoughts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Athna, uh, for a very um, insightful um, presentation. Uh, we have a number of questions that that popped up um, or have been um, added into the chat room. Let me be, um, try to. Uh, uh, consolidate some of these. Um, the first one is, uh, uh, what country uh, offers the most acceptance LG, LBGTB? Which, which, what country offers the most acceptance? And how does the US rank? I'm not, okay, I'm not a person who does these rankings. Mm -hmm. um, I regard these kinds of rankings as ideological tools. Um, on one hand, it is important, it is urgent to have an accounting of the kinds of harms faced by LGBTQIA folks. And for a long time, that did not happen. And the work that is now doing that is critical, is urgent, is being used as a basis for making policy and change. At the same time, we know that those rankings are kind of co-opted, including by governments like the United States, like Israel, uh, like other places to, as an argument to just say, well, we are the most enlightened. And so these rankings become part of foreign policy tools that are in fact used not to think about well-being for folks, but to assert hegemony in the global order and the rightness and the power of your ways of doing things that often are founded on an already in unequal global order. 
Um, and so I think that might be as much as I would like to, I, it, to say is watch who's using the rankings and for what purpose. These are highly political questions. Um, and be suspicious when you hear governments claiming to be very queer friendly while migrants are dying by their thousands. What kind of claim is that? So there's quite a bit of scholarship on Israel and pinkwashing its use of claims to be queer friendly um, as, a, as, a, as a way to also legitimize imperialism and particularly toward Palestinian peoples. Um, but there is also a scholarship about how the U.S. selectively uses claims of being progressive to assert hegemony in the global order. Very good. Um, a question, uh, has the pandemic affected the issue of migration, especially among queer people of color? It's nice to see everyone's wide awake and had coffee. You're putting out all the big questions. <laughs> so. Um, just some starting places to answer and let's let's um, you know, there's a lot to be discussed, but some things we could think about here um, has is the pandemic contributing to migration? Absolutely. Yes. Um, at the same time, what has been the US response has been to try and seal off further further Donald Trump's policy of sealing off the border of Title 42 expulsions, of expelling migrants seeking asylum without any kind of accountability. Um, so it, the US has used the pandemic to block migration, including by queer folks of color who urgently need to be allowed to reach the border, make a claim, have their cases heard. And the pandemic has made that more difficult. It has made being forced to wait in Mexico a situation of extraordinary danger, risk, and difficulty for folks who have been left in the most difficult of conditions, even as different groups have worked to try and provide support and assistance. And I want to acknowledge and give a shout out to that urgent work. Um, in terms of US detention centers, the pandemic, we might hope, um, might have caused some reappraisal of the abysmal policies in terms of healthcare. Um, what we saw instead was a failure to adequately address the pandemic, the risks presented to people, um, and people were becoming sick and dying because of the failure to take the pandemic seriously. Now, some organizations use this as a moment to strategically say, to push for this is a moment to actually stop detaining migrants, right? Um, and that was an important and worthwhile strategy. Um, the response was not along those lines, but it certainly was an important moment to ask the U.S. to revision its, its policies that automatically detain so many migrants, whereas in fact we could flip the script and say the presumption needs to be we don't detain unless the state makes a very urgent case to do so. And so folks tried to use the pandemic for that. Now, detained trans women in particular um, both faced very dire conditions in detention in general, exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, at great risk, they sent letters to group like Trans Queer Pueblo in Phoenix documenting um, conditions that I will not attempt to describe, but it's worth looking for those materials and reading about them. Um, and highlighting the urgency of making change. And that is perhaps also helped to fuel the current campaign that's underway to end trans detention um, and the detention of detained folks who have are HIV positive. Okay. So lots to talk about. I appreciate the question. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Lucas. Um, how much of a need would there be for safe housing, as in a community compound, for queer migrants on the U.S. side or on the Mexican side? Um, his, uh, Lucas's interest is in providing a temporary home to lift up the queer migrant voices. Uh, thank you, Lucas. 
this is also part of an emerging and complicated and important history. Um, so we have seen the expansion and provision of shelters throughout Mexico, many of them by the UNHCR um, for queer and trans folks who are migrating toward the US border. Um, and that has generated both appreciation and concerns. There's a mixed scholarship and mixed experiences about that. For folks who have ended up stranded at, on, at the border in Mexico, hoping to cross to the US, there have been urgent efforts to provide temporary and safe housing and anything folks can do to help with that, give resources, give money, absolutely please do that. These are life-saving efforts. Um, I guess I might expand the question of housing to say this is also an issue to think about within the United States. One of the ways to help folks get out of detention is if they have a, a person who will sponsor them. And that includes providing housing, um, a fixed address. Of course, the fixed address is because ICE wants to be able to know where you're at. Um, but nonetheless, if folks can show they will have housing and support, they they can apply. Um, it's difficult to get released, but they can apply. Um, and getting out of detention means getting away from literally life-threatening conditions, both physically and psychologically, and also and being able to perhaps rest and heal and rebuild and make connections, including to legal services and other groups that can help you put together a case for a status. We know that for detained queer migrants and migrants in general, it is very difficult to put together a case for asylum or any other kind of legal status from within detention. So housing, the provision of housing, and in fact, if we look at the Santa Fe Dreamers, you know, they and other groups have been creating networks of housing. They're also helping potential sponsors understand the responsibilities because it is a significant commitment to assess, is this feasible for you? Is this something you want to do? But person by person, helping folks get out of detention. So yes, the housing issue and for folks released from detention in general, access to housing is one of the most urgent and difficult issues, um, including because we all need a place to be able to lay our heads at night and as a base from which to also be able to seek employment, um, to be not on the street um, and for many, many other reasons. So housing is absolutely an urgent issue on which um, I'm excited to hear questions and thoughts about that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from Natalia. Um, what needs to shift to legally acknowledge economic destitution as one of the intersecting dimensions of migration. Currently, poverty, poverty, including extreme poverty, does not warrant political asylum or other form of legal validity for migration. In Natalia's experience uh, as a migrant and connected with many diaspora communities, People invoke whatever reason pass at the border or in the interviews when they flee deathly destitution. So uh, you have it in front of you, correct? And so, yeah, okay. Well, thank you, Natalia. That's also a really urgent issue. Um, and it kind of gets at the fundamental questions I was trying to raise and that Beloved Home is raising um at the beginning of the talk so we do know that u.s policies in fact are set up they're on a capitalist colonialist basis and who is going to get legal status are folks are, are not folks who are poor that's actually how the policy works P being poor is also used to disqualify claims for asylum as you probably well know um folks fleeing as seeking asylum this, it's easily argued and it is consistently argued and in immigration courts and cases are denied on the grounds. No, you're not really fleeing persecution. You're actually an economic migrant who's just trying to get in by claiming persecution. 
Now, critical migration scholars actually challenge that there's a distinction between forced and voluntary migration and argue that we have to think economic shapes all migration all migrations, I'm sorry, I realize I detoured a little bit from Francisco's face. Um, so, so first of all, why is migration happening? The roots are in colonialist capitalism and the immigration system perpetuates that by making migrants unable to access legal status. So there are two paths to legal status. One is kind of regular immigration, generally family or work. For those, again, you need to meet an economic threshold in order to be let in. in in other words, and Donald Trump tried to ramp this up, but this is consistent across all administrations. Since 1996, even if you have family here and they apply to sponsor you, they have to show they meet a certain economic threshold, even if the state recognizes you are family. So we could say this means family reunification is only for those who have a certain amount of money. Um, that, 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 that is a problem in my view. Similarly, folks fleeing economic uh, destitution, including the impacts of climate change, um, need to have an avenue for um, being allowed to flee, to get safe passage, to be allowed to remain where they need to remain. You're absolutely correct that the refugee system and the asylum system also not only doesn't allow that, but if those are your circumstances, those circumstances are often used to cast suspicion on any other claims for us, any other grounds you might have for seeking asylum. I haven't helped in any way. I've I've more said everything you said is an urgent issue, and that is why we need to rethink migration policies um, toward questions of economic colonial, settler colonial justice. And we're not doing that right now, whether it's the regular system or the refugee system. Thank you. Um, we have a question from, I believe, T. Um, is there a certain place or region of the brain for gender identity? Um, I am a transgender and changed from male to female starting in 2005 and received surgery in 2015. I believe there's a physical genetic brain cause for gender dys dysphoria. Um, I'm not sure if you can address that or not, um, Ethna. Um, I, I... Thank you, T. I am not the right person to address that. I do know it is a highly, um, it is a topic that is widely discussed and people have pretty different viewpoints. Um, I, I, I would, so, but I, I, I am not qualified to go any more in depth into that. Okay. Um, a question from Nick. Um, as a white male born in the US, who receives the economic benefits of US dominance, what should I be prepared to give up as we move towards a just society? <laughs> there you go. I don't know. What do you think? Um, so, yeah. Um, I think there are different ways we can parse that question, right? Um, I think. Some folks experience, the vision I put out is a vision that in fact, um, well-being for some does not have to come at the expense of other people. And I believe that and I try to proceed on that basis. Other people doubt that um, and do worry that, you know, there's only a limited pie and if somebody's doing okay, somebody else is gonna lose out. Um, so we do hear that kind of a conversation. We also hear folks shifting the conversation um, by, for example, there was a recent book out that argued, um, it, and it made a pretty compelling case, that racism costs white folks quite a bit. Um, because, for example, lots of policies that would just be good for everybody, including white folks. And, and one chapter is about, for example, public swimming pools, right? Um, which were created, you know, around the early 20th century um, and were really a wonderful thing to have in communities. But these are racially segregated communities. 
And with the move toward trying to um, integrate public pools, most towns move toward, we'll just close the pool, right? They didn't want to integrate. So we can ask who benefits from this? Did white folks gain or lose from this kind of an approach? Is there an approach where we could think about keeping the pools open as a benefit for everybody? That would be one way to talk about gain and loss is, is to actually think about, um, you know, I don't, I'm not here to sit on judgment about folks, and, and, and I hope the conversation is not going in that direction. Um, I think we are all participants in that conversation to figure out our own stakes. And I would say, for example, for me, something I think I can benefit from shifts is um, at the moment, my, my daily life and my legal status depends on violence toward other people. And that doesn't feel right to me. So I don't see I would lose. I see I would benefit if we could change some of the underlying relationships that are involved. And I think lots of creative people are out there talking about how we can have a framework that in fact is not about take from some to give to the other. Um, but you do open a large question, and, and I gave you my kind of personal take on it, but there will be as many opinions as people. Um, let, me, let me finish with a question of my own. Um, and the question I want to end, uh, end with is, who's, which, you know, several years ago, we, Erasema um, Coronado and I, uh, Arizona State University, have taken students to Arizona to do sort of border consciousness issues and we met with some lgbtq communities um there are communities doing things well uh could you end up about can you end the conversation with what is it that they're doing and what is it that they're doing well um to address the the intersections of, of sexuality and migration So your question, I appreciate your question because mm -hmm. indeed, you know, we've moved from a time until 1990, if you're, if you're known by the immigration service to be LGBT, you could be denied entry or be deported, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that created a very particular and difficult situation for the, I imagine millions of LGBTQ migrants living in the United States. And that includes in terms of lack of narrative, lack of organization building, or having to do lots of work that was had to be not visible to authorities. In the last 30 years, some of what we've seen, and particularly since the turn of the millennium, is really the emergence of some extraordinary activism and community building by queer migrant organizations who highlight their issues and agenda, but are always working in tandem with other groups and working to build a big picture um, that thinks about the well-being of everybody, but prioritizes the, the, the folks most affected. Some of the groups that I pay attention to, who I, I appreciate how they navigate among competing priorities while I was forwarding the voices and perspectives of those who are, who um, perhaps are most harmed by the system. Um, I'm thinking about, I, I follow Mi Gente, which is an activist um, group that um, out of Chicago, but I also have been following Familia Transqueer Liberation because, you know, Familia Transqueer Liberation has targeted in 2016 to shut down the trans detention pod that was at that time in Santa Ana. And they were very clear, like we're shutting down the pod. And yes, it is for trans women who are dying of this, but it is not just for trans women. It is for my uncle, it is for my aunt, it is for all of us, right? That these changes that we can make are not just for one person, one group, but for a broad vision of well being for everybody. Um, and that is a very difficult path to hew, but I certainly follow groups like Mi Gente, um, Trans Queer Liberation, the Queer Detainee Empowerment Project, um, and folks like them, because I just feel they, 
they managed to put out an intersectional vision that is very concrete um, and offers pathways forward without prescribing because part of what we need to do is you know understand the lay of the land and then each of us think what feels comfortable for us to do and what's feasible to do so they put out possibilities but it's not in a prescriptive way and i just appreciate mm -hmm. that very much that's good, good thank you thank you very much um and uh we've reached the end of our time um and again i want to thank you professor louvet for a very insightful very uh, uh thought-provoking uh, conversation um, today, and I hopefully people could uh, uh, draw from this and, and take it and, and, of course, create the just communities uh, of respect as well uh, with the intention of the dignity of the other. Thank you very much.